Well, good afternoon. Welcome to Citrus, and we're delighted to have everybody join us and make it through the inclement weather today, uh, and particularly as we're at the end of the semester with so many pressing things. But I think, as we all know, uh, this is an extraordinarily worthwhile session to be at. We're here today to hear Dr. David Hausler speak to us around uh, the global exchange of human genetic uh, data, and we're very excited to have him here. My name is David Lindemann. I'm Director of Healthcare here at Citrus. And before we start, I'd just like to give a few announcements uh, to share with you. We're delighted to have, of course, our colleagues at the different campuses join us and uh, following the program today uh, through our web uh, program. Uh, we'd also like to let you know that there are several other programs still going on as the semester comes to a close. Today we actually are hosting at 5 o'clock the Berkeley Innovators Series here. And we're going to have Jack McCauley who is presenting on Design Mastermind of Guitar Hero and Oculus. So I hope that folks can come back and join us later today. And next Thursday we're having a program that's very exciting, the Count Me In group about walking in the city, which will be here on Thursday, December 11th and it will be from 2 to 5 p.m., a full sem uh, seminar on the program, which during the fall of 2014, a whole team of students, 23 students, uh, graduate students and professors, worked with the city of San Leandro, working, walking through the city, developing digital tools to improve the way city residents uh, communicate, live, work, play together. So they will be presenting uh, information along with city officials and industry leaders on the challenges for planning and encouraging urban mobility. So we encourage you to join us for that program. It'll be an excellent program next week. Uh, we also like to mention that this is the final program that we have in terms of our research seminars for the semester, and we will be starting when uh, campus reconvenes later in January. So please look for our list of the programs. It'll be every Wednesday uh, again at noon. So we're hoping to have you here. So without further ado, I'd like to do just a brief introduction and turn the program over to Dr. Hausler. We're very uh, fortunate to have him here today to speak on such an important issue, and particularly with the team and work that he's done at Santa Cruz. Uh, Dr. Hausler is known for his work leading the team that assembled the first human genome sequence in the Race to Complete the Human Genome Project. And subsequently, his team has done comparative genomic analysis that deepens understanding the molecular function and evolution of the genome. His work is, uh, involves statistical and algorithmic methods to explore the molecular function, evolution, and disease process in the human genome. And he does work integrating comparative and high-throughput genomics data to study gene structure, form, and function. At this point, uh, his team is currently working at uh, the US UC Santa Cruz in terms of developing the Genome Browser, a web-based tool that is used extensively in biomedical research and serves, along with the European Ensemble Platform, virtually all large-scale vertebrate genomics projects. Uh, Dr. Hausler uh, himself is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. He's Professor of Biomolecular Engineering and Director of the Center for Biomolecular Science and Engineering at UC Santa Cruz. He's Director of the California Institute for Quantitative Biosciences, which is QB3 for those of you who are involved in that, at UC Santa Cruz. And we're delighted to call him a colleague within the Citrus program. So without further ado, David Hauser. Thanks so much, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, as a QB3 representative uh, talking to our sister group, Citrus, and I think there, there is an enormous uh, possibility for future collaborations between QB3 and Citrus. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about one of the uh, computing efforts that are happening within QB3 and other related uh, institutes that are tackling uh, cancer uh, and other medical diseases from a point of view of genetics. And in particular, I mean, talking about an international group, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health that was recently formed um, and uh, is really, uh, I think, has the potential to revolutionize the way we handle big data in medicine, uh, showing the way starting with genomic, uh, genetic data, and then uh, expanding to other types of data. So I want to motivate the talk with an example that's 
graphic enough to uh, get your attention. Uh, this is a patient who suffers from metastatic melanoma. His cancer, like other cancers, are caused by DNA mutations that happen in particular cells and then grow into a tumor composed of those mutated cells and then eventually metastasize and spread through the body to seed other tumors. You can see every one of these lumps is a tumor of billions of cells all generated from a unique combination of initial mutations that occurred. All of these cells, or nearly all of these cells, have one thing in common. They have a particular mutation in a gene called BRAF in a position that alters the 600th amino acid. That actually is a specific mutation that we see recurring again and again in different types of cancers, not only in melanoma, but often in other types of cancers. The drug company Roche was able to develop a compound, vermorafenib, that specifically kills any cell with that mutation. And you see the spectacular results of this on this individual. 15, year, 15 weeks later, he's working out at the gym, swimming in the pool. An amazing recovery of the type that was never seen before by previous cancer therapies, including therapies that are based on chemo or radiation, which is the common mode today. Now, unfortunately, if every cell that was mutated and driving the cancer had the identical mutation, we would be in good shape. But the problem is a tumor consisting of billions of cells is actually undergoing some kind of mini evolutionary process. And this diagram shows that there may be an initial event that started that cell multiplying, dividing in a, in a semi-uncontrolled fashion. But later on, in one of those cells, another mutation happened, this red mutation that drove it harder and so forth. We think there are typical of perhaps half a dozen different mutations that accumulate through time that get us into the very bad state that we are in, in a particular tumor. And that means that at any given time, there were different tumor cells within the tumor that have different subsets of those mutations. And this process is continually happening. So new mutations can arise. So what happened with this patient unfortunately was that after 23 weeks, it was evident that the therapy was no longer working. It had successfully killed all the cells with the BRAF mutation, but those without the BRAF mutation grew out and replaced those tumors. And if you look, this, these, you look at this series of tumors, that's all, this arc of tumors is almost an exact map. So they came right back. Now, all you have to do is do the calculations. Billions of cells, certain mutation rates, how many mutations might they have uh, accrued before therapy, how many additional ones might they accrue after therapy, and you realize this is actually an expected consequence. There's enough mutational diversity in cancer that a single targeted therapy towards one mutation is unlikely to work in a metastatic case like this. So what happens is we are involved in an arms race. Every time a patient is treated for cancer at this point, you are in an arms race as you try to kill the cancer cells and they either exploit pre-existing mutations or uncover new mutations. It's reminiscent of what we saw with HIV AIDS. And if you remember that struggle, it wasn't until we got a cocktail of three different therapies that hit three different parts, vulnerabilities of the virus at once, that we got really effective treatments. Many people think that that's the same for cancer at this point. We have to start hitting it in multiple places so there isn't this tiny fraction of a residue of invulnerable cells left behind. Another area in cancer treatment that is extremely hot and we are now getting deeply involved in is autologous immunotherapies, where you beef up the patient's own immune system, help maybe train it or encourage it to target the cancer cells. So you have a combination now of specific drug therapies and the patient's own immune cells attacking the tumor cells. That is a powerful way, again, we can exploit this idea of combination therapy. 
So many people are discouraged by this. And they've been discouraged for decades and decades about the slow progress in the treatment of cancer. Cancer seems like it's such a clever disease that it can mutate, it will escape our, our treatments, and that this process might go on forever. I want to tell you right now that it won't because of one fundamental difference. If you think about our fight with HIV AIDS, yes, that might go on forever because that virus may have mutations that evade our current therapies. We might invent new therapies and then the virus might mutate again. And that might go on if it's not HIV AIDS. Other infectious agents may be in a permanent arms race with us. Cancer is not for one simple reason. Those mutations that happen in a single patient during the course of therapy are never passed on to that patient's children or anybody else. When your kids get cancer, heaven forbid, or your grandkids get cancer, it won't, be, it won't have the benefit of learning from any previous battles. It will be as naive as your cancer. So once we learn to win this race in a single typical, typical cancer case, that will work for all future generations. So there is hope that we can make a very dramatic impact on cancer, but it will only happen if we confront the full molecular complexity of the disease. In particular, it's striking to think that we knew the, that cancer was caused by mutations for now decades, but only very recently have we been able to read those mutations. So just now, in an eye blink, in terms of our history of battling cancer, has, have we had the ability to actually read all of the mutations in a patient's tumor systematically? That, on an appropriate scale, could really tilt the balance. We get a new patient, we read the entire molecular status of the patient, we compare it to all previous patients, we generalize from that, and we come up with a custom treatment. This is the idea of precision medicine for cancer. It does have potential, and I think enormous potential. Why haven't we done this earlier? I think it's simply been a cost issue. We started out in the year 2000 with the first genome, which cost approximately $300 million, just in machines and reagents, to produce that one first human genome. The genome sequencing technology since that point has undergone an amazing exponential improvement to the point today that a genome costs roughly $1,000. If you plot that on this exponential plot versus Moore's law, you see that improvement of DNA technology is trouncing the improvement of computer technology at this point. And I, I love this. You and Ashley at Stanford made a great calculation. He said, you know, I drive by the, the Ferrari dealer every day, and I look at this Ferrari Spider, you know, for $400,000, and he calculated that what if automobiles had improved at the same rate during this time period? That Ferrari would cost 40 cents. So this is really spectacular in terms of a technological improvement. So what do we do with this? Well, one of the major programs in the United States has been the Cancer Genome Atlas, an assault on cancer looking at the first the 20 major types of adult cancer. Now it's expanded to about 30 different types of cancer. The goal is to get 10,000 tumors completely analyzed. And not only do we do the genome of the tumor, but we do the genome of the other tissue, the normal tissue, in the same individual so we can contrast the two and isolate the genetic differences that exist only in the tumor and not in the regular tissue of the person. So that's 20,000 full genomes is the aim for this. We started by primarily sequencing the genetic uh, coding parts that, uh, that uh, genetic parts that code for proteins, and we're expanding that now. Um, we had the honor of building some of the big data infrastructure for that. Since this is a talk about big data, I'll keep you, uh, I'll give you a quick tour of that. We call it Cancer Genomics Hub. The NCI actually, the National Cancer Institute actually asked us to do this for all of their major genomics efforts. So all of the NCI's um, projects for cancer genomics, including this project and the target project for childhood cancers and others, 
feed into a database that we built. Uh, we house it at the San Diego Supercomputer Center. And the bottom line, the real take home, is that and all of the infrastructure, including uh, everything amortized out, uh, once we're at 50,000 genomes, ends up being $100 per year per genome. A small price to pay, I claim, to keep this information around and make it available for research, rather than thinking about separating, se uh, sequencing every case individually, looking at it, and then throwing away that raw data. The raw data is big. Uh, a genome is about 200 gigabytes these days. And uh, if you add them all together, we have a database currently of 1.5 petabytes. Uh, you, you were familiar with a petabyte, 10 to the power of 15, one with 15 zeros after it. Um, it's a significant amount of data. It's not so much data that you can't, if you think of YouTube, or they, they deal in petabytes. So it's not outrageous. Um, it's it puts biology in the realm of other things like the Large Hadron Collider and so forth, which is operating at about 15 petabytes per year. Uh, so we're in that ballpark, which is new for, for molecular biology and, and medicine. Uh, but still, um, it's doable. Um, we are able to serve the data to researchers that want to study it at uh, about 5 gigabits per second. We peak at about 15 gigabits per second. That line is busy pretty much... Uh, constantly, and we ship an average of a petabyte per month uh, to researchers all over the world who are uh, qualified uh, to uh, look at the raw genome data by the National Institute of Health. The growth has been uh, exponential, uh, and, and we, we see it um, as, a, as a powerful way to uh, help, but the model itself uh, which was dictated to us by the National Institutes of Health when we first did this, is still uh, not the most sophisticated model. You download the data, you compute on it in your own center. We need to move to a more cloud model where uh, the, the data are kept in different copies in different places around the world and you can get to that and bring your computation to the data. And that will be more efficient in the long run. In particular, you can imagine a world in which you have a patient or a set of patients at your medical center and you want to compare them to other medical centers, you may want to take that information to a place that has a large amount of data, perform some computation and get the results back. That will be the basic form of this precision medicine and we want to really explore this possibility. Can all of this information we now know at detail about the molecular nature of cancers in general and various subtypes of cancers can that really help us with the treatment of an individual patient? There are a number of obstacles to realizing this dream, and many of us got together and decided that we would tackle this head on. In particular, eight of us founded a organization called the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health specifically to make this a reality, not just for cancer, but for all diseases. So the mission is simply to enable rapid progress in biomedicine. It's been very successful. We now have 170 members from about 40 companies. These include large medical institutes, uh, funding agencies, patient advocacy agencies, universities. Um, really uh, a, a, an incredible group has joined us. And we even have a larger group of individuals. This is just institutions that have joined. We want to create and maintain an interoperable technology, uh, an interoperable set, a set of interoperable uh, technology standards, um, and emphasize the fact that there is now a mechanism for sharing this data. What is happening, unfortunately, is somewhat similar that happened with electronic medical records. The institutions were designing a system where they would keep their own data in their own silo and not set up any infrastructure for sharing the data outside of their institution. And that actually started a lot of standards that became entrenched within the institute and incompatible with other institutes, making it even harder to share in the future. So once a silo gets established, it's hard to break it, and we do not want that to happen with genetic data. It's a new kind of data, 
And everybody has to build this infrastructure, which is actually vastly bigger for most data, data uh, most medical centers. It's a vastly bigger data infrastructure than they had to build before. So we want to catch them right at the beginning and say, look, it will help you be part of an international coalition. We'll allow you to exchange data. You just have to keep it in a cloud type environment. It could be a private cloud or a public cloud but in a way that satisfies the format for exchange that we are doing. And that format is expressed with an API, now an Applications Programming Interface, that you can get online. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. And the object is to break those silos and allow information to work over the Internet, connecting different cloud resources, and exchange uh, the vital information we need for sharing. I, I, you know, I, I haven't said it, but for the statisticians in the audience, it has to be clear that you, know, you have a genome with three billion different bases. There's so many different combinations of mutations that can happen and drive cancer that in fact every cancer really is part of a subtype or a sub-subtype that is essentially a rare disease. If you fully classify a cancer at the molecular level, when you see a patient, you're always looking at a patient with a rare disease. And it's just a matter of statistical power. If you're just looking at information from your medical center, you don't have enough statistical power to make conclusions based on the few examples you've ever seen. And then often it's the first time you've ever seen that particular sub-sub case. You need to have access to get the statistical power to make inference. You need to have access to a much larger N, a much larger set of examples. So. The advantages of storing and sharing uh, data in a federated cloud-based commons, as I've described, is number one, and this is essential uh, from if you look at international uh, sentiment and legality and so forth, that there's no single owner. It would be great if uh, an entity like Google or the U.S. government could just hold all of the world's genomics data for everybody. It's not going to fly socially, right? So we have to have a coalition of groups that agree to exchange data but maintain control of their own data. Globalization is the essential thing that will get us the statistical power we need and has to be ubiquitously available and available on a, on a transaction kind of like you think about in the financial sector. The medical sector is way, way late to the party. I mean, we, we have much more advanced usage of the internet and cloud-based computing in other sectors. We need to make up for that. It's obviously there are a number of, th there's three benefits to cloud-based computing at the end. Uh, you know, reduce cost because you can leverage it in, by putting it in uh, the right data center, cheap, cheap electricity, bulk purchases, security is great for the cloud, and elasticity is the number one thing, right? The cost of one computer for a thousand hours is the same as the cost, <coughs> excuse me, of a thousand computers for one hour. That's great. So you don't have to, um, you don't have to design your medical center's institute to handle the maximum load you would ever expect. So if we deep down, we go deep down under the hood at the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, here's kind of the operating mode. First of all, we're building a large set of open source software starting with specifications. These are data schemas that describe the objects like a DNA sequence read and so forth formally that we are going to be exchanging. Uh, and then various uh, calls that you can make on them, retrieving them, comparing them, and so forth, all at an abstract level. This happens at GitHub uh, on this site, which you can go to and see in action. Uh, there are an enormous number of people participating because everybody is welcome to participate. So we have representatives from every major company that has anything to do with genomics, all of the universities that are doing major uh, things in genomics, and many other sectors. The decision making under this open source model is uh, we adopted the Apache Open Source Software Foundation's rules essentially. So you will find that you will drill down into a specific task team that's doing a specific project and you'll see, okay, now we're going to modify this API. I might make a pull request saying, okay, I think this field has to be changed. It's a discussion. 
You get votes from the people that are involved in that particular technical decision. They're either plus one, minus one, or zero. Don't care. Once you get three plus ones without a minus one, it's done. And the pull request happens, and we move forward. So we don't want to be, it, this is it, the experience of doing large global open source projects. Luckily, was there in place already. There have been many of them before us. And so we just take that culture and use it. It's working really well. And there are in, there's intense activity now uh, on this GitHub site. At the same point, we do have to make larger uh, directional decisions, and we've decided that the leadership is determined by the amount of contribution. So we have people rising to the point of leading task teams based on what they've actually contributed uh, at that point. Our simple mantra is compete on the interface, uh, collaborate on the interface, compete on the implementation. So we're very open to for-profit companies. Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and many, many other for-profit companies are involved. And they are happy to create a common interface. And they are uh, happy that they also have the ability to, co to come up with their own kick-ass implementation of it uh, behind the interface. So um, it works like this. You can have interoperability through an API. This is uh, everyone in computer science, of course, knows this fact. Um, and the many repositories using the same API can then support many applications at an application layer. In particular, here's an example of an application that is a driving project, one of the driving projects for the Global Alliance called Beacon. It works like this. Uh, you can ask for any of the repositories that participate do you have an A at position whatever on chromosome 3? Right? So any simple query like this, um, do you have any genomes with an A at that particular position? So this is great for rare variants. So if you come up with a variant that you've never seen before, you can ask all the sites that, are, that have agreed to send beacon out or answer beacon queries, and they will answer yes, no, or... Uh, I won't answer that. The object here was to come up with the absolute simplest API for actually sharing data over the internet. And then most of the work is the social work. And we'll go back to that. It's getting people to think about sharing. It's looking at regulation and policy and so forth. We wanted to make the actual software dead simple in order to force a dialogue about sharing. And if they say, no, we won't share, they won't answer this simple question, then we ask why. So this is a way to get the thing started. It's up. There are a number of uh, resources now and increasing all the time more uh, answers. This is a beacon of beacons. It's kind of a centralized query that you can make that will automatically go all over the world and see if anybody's seen this particular genetic variant that you just found. It's open, totally unrestricted. Anybody can use it. Uh, and that has a, an enormous benefit. Uh, we'll get back to the issues in, in a minute about what, what happens with privacy uh, when you do this. So what are we thinking about here in terms of this big data model? There are three elements that are essential to a model like this. We need to name objects. We need a protocol about how to get information from them and put information into them. We need an idea of what the content of these objects really is, a formal definition of that. Now, on the web, names are basically URLs. Protocol is fundamentally HTTP. And the content is defined often by HTML. So these standards allow the internet to work and do what it does so extraordinarily well. Now, for a specialized sector like uh, our biomedical sector at this point, we need to take this further into the concepts that are the coin of the realm in that particular center. So our global alliance APIs are actually defining specific content digest, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what that is, for the kind of objects that we actually work with. M the main one would be like the set of reads from your genome, the set of DNA reads, these sh these pieces of DNA that are produced by the sequencing machine from your, from your genome uh, has to be identified somehow. It has to have a unique identifier. And then we have to be able to have methods for searching it. So we have specific uh, 
uh, elements of the API that describe how to search that information and what the format of the response would be. And then finally, um, we need to have a logical schema about what that information is. Once you get it, how can you interpret it? What are the semantics of that? Uh, and the schemas uh, provide that. This day, idea of unique global digest is something that Matt Massey here at Berkeley actually introduced, and he leads the task team, along with Frank Nothoff, also at Berkeley, uh, that is defining this for the Global Alliance at this point. Imagine a situation where you've read all this DNA from an individual and you have this uh, item um, which contains all of those reads. We don't want to dictate your internal storage format for that item. You may be storing that as a binary file. You may be storing it in some database. What we care about is the content of that. So what we want to do is take a cryptographic one-way hash on the content of this, produce a abstract hashed, hashed value, and then use that as a way of identifying that unique content of data. Because of the properties of the hash, we can make sure that it's going to be unique. It's incredibly unlikely that we would get the same hash for two different contents. It's unforgeable because you can work back, you can rehash what you get. If I send you Jill's genome with Sarah's digest, you immediately know something's wrong because you rehash the genome and see that it doesn't match the hash that you got. It's privacy preserving because there's no way you can get back to that actual raw DNA if you just have the identifier. And this is an issue because people are private about their DNA sequences. And it's decentralized. You can create it. We don't need a centralized authority to create that. Here's a little um, example about how it works. Many of you may be familiar with the fact that we have been exchanging genetic data for a while produced by large-scale sequencing in a format called BAM, SAM or BAM, and that is a file format. So that was the first actual spec, and we do have a group within the Global Alliance that's working very hard on that file format spec. Each of these records within this um, represent a element of a read within that uh, within that data set, and we have one such value for every DNA read within the data set. You can imagine hashing those to represent the raw content and then to represent the entire set of reads you can hash the hashes essentially and that gives you a unique identifier uh, and that's the blue, the blue vertical box, a unique digest essentially a reasonably short random looking string that uniquely identifies the content of this file. If I redo this, not as a BAM file, but I do it as another type of database, which is essential because BAM files can be very inefficient to store and index in some cases, uh, I will get the same hash. It doesn't matter what it looks like as a file, it's the content that matters. So I won't go into this all, uh, in detail, but basically if you put this together, you get the three, uh, the two areas that we're really working on, compute environment and uh, data environment. We want to be able to have this modular uh, compute capability. We want to make sure um, that uh, we can use this and we use this reliably. Uh, the, data, uh, the data digest that we've been talking about become a, a very durable way of identifying a data set and, and um, uh, archiving it in a, in a way that is unambiguous. Um, and everything is about um, the only working through the API. So we have to work with you, and I encourage you, if you're interested in this, to join the, the Global Alliance so we can get this API right, so that we get to the point that it really is all you need to know. You don't have to dig into the internals of how the data are stored. You just need to operate through the API. If we get to that beautiful level of abstraction, we'll be doing great. Now, because people are worried about this DNA data, we have, have to deal with security. I'm not going to go into this intensively, but we have a separate working group from the data working group whose activities I've been describing uh, that looks specifically at security, uh, heavy use of encryption. We will have a number of interfaces that require you to be authorized and authenticated in order to access the data. 
In particular, the beacon that I just said has a deeper security model. So if you look at the way this works, this query is sufficiently general that we actually open it up to everybody in the world without any security. Anybody, anonymous user, can ask of a big institute, have you ever seen a genome with an A at this position? You get the answer. However, if you start to ask properties, did it come from a patient with a certain disease? This kind of thing can be sensitive. That requires, at minimum, a registered user. And then finally, can you show me all of the DNA from that patient? That will require a user to actually sign a contract that they're not going to do anything nefarious once they get that person's DNA. So we have three levels uh, of access. These are social constructs. So we have an entire other working group set on policy, regulatory, and law. And it's very important when you're dealing with international that you actually have uh, an, an entity that, that is willing to look across national boundaries for laws, privacy laws in particular, that may prevent us from accomplishing what we want. So these are the four groups. Genome Data Working Group that I lead with Richard Durbin. Then there's a clinical data working group that talks about how to represent the diseases and the tests associated with those that aren't genomic. Security working group and regulatory and ethics working group. So uh, I want to say that there are, there's other driving projects. Uh, in addition to the Beacon project, there's the Genomic Matchmaker and the BRCA Challenge project. Uh, and I won't have time to talk to you about those, but those of you that are concerned with breast cancer, the BRCA Challenge Project is a very, very important project to try to get everybody globally to share information about the specific breast cancer susceptibility gene. What mutations are present and what do they mean for your uh, clinical outcome uh, when you have those mutations and you get cancer? That information will be very important. There are a number of specific task teams, which I'll skip over for lack of time. Um, but these are all uh, the different task teams. For example, um, Matt Massey and Frank Nothoff uh, lead the containers and workflow uh, task team. Um, and, uh, and, and we have Stephen Brenner, for example, uh, is one of the co-leads here at Berkeley on the genome annotation team. So we have a number of people in different uh, places and it happens to have two teams that have direct leadership from Berkeley. Um, what is the, I want to close, and I'm going to skip some of the slides for lack of time, I'm sorry, but I want to close with some general thoughts about cancer. So as of 2009, it looked pretty dismal. We had made great, great progress in reducing death from heart disease, but very little progress from cancer. You might see this little downturn here. Well, that played out. That's for real. So we are still going down on cancer. So the good news is that just in the last month, we've released very good statistics sh <coughs> showing that we have a genuine improvement in cancer mortality. But it's, uh, there is a lot more work to do. I was going to say a few things about cancers of the nerve cells. I will just give you really a whirlwind tour of this. Um, there are many kinds of cancers that can develop from many kinds of nerve cells in, the, in your, your spine or ex external nerve tissue or in, in within external to the brain or inside the brain. Uh, neurons inside the brain can all uh, develop different types of cancers. Oftentimes, these occur in very young children, especially the neuroblastomas, uh, and this is particularly heart-wrenching. And you can see that during that time where cells are growing, the body is growing, cells are differentiating to become special uh, parts of the body, uh, when that goes wrong, you, you see this abnormal growth uh, that is a, a, a neuroblastoma or a ganglioneuroblastoma or ganglioneuroma. Oftentimes, you would have this as a typical case. A nine-year-old male comes in with high-risk neuroblastoma. This is an actual case uh, that Alina Moritzova is working with in our uh, group. It's disease refractory. You try a, 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 a therapy, switch to another one. Complete response means that the child is essentially seemingly free of the cancer, but then it comes back. Uh, Try another one, comes back again, and now you're really thinking, okay, uh, the standard stuff doesn't work. We need to go individual with this. We talked about the power of data. This is really almost like N of 1. 
there's one kid that's really got this particular circumstance. So how do we deal with that? It's a, especially in childhood cancers, these small cohorts are extremely difficult to deal with. We would like to be able to understand the subtypes and have the maximum amount of data. And we'd also like to match childhood data from adult cancer data, which is so much more numerous, and try to see if there is a lesson that we can transfer over to childhood cancer. Uh, in order to do that, we've set up a project called the Treehouse Childhood Cancer Project. It is, in a sense, a sister to our adult cancer project that I described. We have this very, very large database of cancer cases now, um, and we can collect uh, these rarer uh, childhood cancer cases and compare them to our massive adult cancer case and help researchers to understand childhood cancer better. And that's the goal of Treehouse. Um, I'm going to really say a few things incredibly fast. Sorry, this is just staccato show. But basically, the other uh, cancer that we talked that was on part of the slide, other than neuroblastoma, is glioma. So this is a cancer of the of the gliomal cells, uh, and this is a, a a brain cancer. It's common in young adults. It often has an onset in young adults, 20s, 30s. Uh, these, this is this part of the this is this part of the of the tree that I showed earlier of different subtypes of cancer, and it's currently assessed by the grade of cancer by looking at the tissue. So this is how uh, you would be treated. The first thing is a pathologist would look at a slice of the tumor tissue taken out from a brain biopsy and decide whether it's it has an astrocytic look or an oligodendrolite look. Some of them are mixed and hard to uh, pla uh, classify, and often different pathologists will say different things. We want to go into the molecular details of this. So we want to, instead of looking at the tissue, we want to go in and sequence the tissue. And these are examples of these DNA reads. They don't fit entirely on the slide. They're about 300 bases long. You can align them and see where they match within a reference human genome, and based on that, in this patient, we see that there are extra reads matching in this whole region, and there are also reads that match on this end and then come back and match again on the other end. That's because in the cancer patient, this whole region, which is about 500 bases long, is actually repeated in tandem. And this happens in an error of chromosome replication. And if there are driver genes in this for the cancer, that might be a big deal. We can have more complicated rearrangements. In particular, here's a rearrangement that leads to a duplication. This is a drop in the copy number instead of extra copy number. And there are all these rearrangement breakpoints where one part of the genome is connected to a abnormally connected to a different part of the genome in the cancer. We look at that cancer and we can actually trace out what the cancer genome looks like. Here's a little movie. There's the typical piece one, and then we have a backwards copy of piece four, forwards copy of piece two, then we skip over three and continue on with piece five. That's a very unusual uh, arrangement, uh, obviously an abnormal arrangement. The tumor looks like this, whereas the normal genome has one, two, three, four, five segments. And it, this is further confirmed by the fact that we see the copy number of segment three is much lower. So we have one good copy of three and uh, two good copies of all the other segments. So if you look at this in our UCSC genome browser, you can see that there's a whole piece of the genome that's flipped, and this blue arrow containing these genes is actually absent. That allows us to actually think about the genome, this cancer genome, as a separate genome and analyze what the effect would be of having lost that gene and inverted that other piece of DNA. Now, it can get more complicated than this. Here's a case where we find a piece of DNA abnormally connected to another piece of DNA and so forth. We can go forward through the errors, arrows, right? So all of these pieces of DNA, this is the reference genome along here, are abnormally connected. And if you follow this around, you actually get back to where you started from. And for good reason, this patient, a glioblastoma patient, has an extra copy of a bunch of these genes that are arranged in a little circular chromosome called the double minute. And they actually have multiple copies of this within every cell of the cancer. And this contains some very, very dangerous genes on it, MDM2, which inhibits P53 in particular uh, and drives the cancer, is a very, very dangerous gene to amplify. So it's probably a key part of this. Here's another one that's even more complicated. 
and has, uh, has an amplification on a separate circular chromosome of this gene EGFR, which is very, very commonly amplified and mutated in glioblastoma, brain cancers. This is some uh, actual laboratory work confirming that this circular piece of DNA does exist in high number in the cancer cells. So if we look at this, there's all kinds of a molecular story that identifies GBMs. These are the green dots in this picture. And, and actually contrast them from other types of cancer. This is breast cancer, for example. So if we go through the 20 cancers, we can see that they, if we plot them in terms of their molecular characteristics, kind of forced to be a two, on a two-dimensional space, so uh, dimensionality reduction, we see that they do cluster together according to different types and subtypes. And in fact, we knew a lot about uh, low-grade gliomas. Uh, there are, uh, in particular, a, a glioma, sorry, we, we already knew that there were two types of gliomas, the, the glioblastomas and the lower grade gliomas, and there's a funny pathway where you can go from a lower grade to a higher grade as opposed to getting the higher grade glioma right away. <clears throat> now, the lower grade gliomas were hard to treat. This is zooming in on if we look at lower grade and glioblastoma, the red, it looks like there are two very different types of lower grade glioma, and indeed, we can find that, and some of them, actually, some of the lower grades look like higher grade. So if you go into this in detail, you can see that they don't look all that different from a tissue point of view. But when we did all this analysis at the molecular point of view, including not only the DNA sequencing, but looking at the RNAs and looking at the modifications of the DNA, we were able to cluster all of these hundreds of cases into three very concordant groups. And those groups corresponded with three different mutations status. This one is basically has this key gene IDH1 not mutated or wild type. This one has it mutated, but also has a deletion of chromosome 1P and 19Q. And then this one has the mutated IGH1 and no, uh, this is no co-deletion, this is the deletion. So we strongly, these three molecular types strongly correlate with the other features of gene expression and so forth. And they actually, if you, if you now plot how long the person lives, colored by different types, this was the previous status before this TCJ group got a hold of this. If you had astrocytoma, you were likely to die earlier than somebody who had oligoastrocytoma or oligodendroma, but there's a lot of confusion and not real separation between these. If we reclassify based on these three molecular statuses, then we get a very strong uh, separation in survival, and we see strongly that the IDH wild type, the unmutated IDH gliomas, are much worse. You tend to die much faster within a year or two um, versus the others. And that is a very important piece of information. It actually um, showed that the, these branch of low-grade gliomas actually look like the gliomas. Uh, these are the, the, I've added two more for the glioblastomas. Um, so we have a part of low-grade glioma that looks more like glioma. Here's another uh, molecular snapshot. These are the three types of low-grade glioma, and that's glioblastoma. These two look a lot alike. So um, we were actually misdiagnosing or incompletely diagnosing some of the lower grades who were in actually much more danger because they had a glioblastoma-like disease. And the good thing is that now the next uh, World Health Organization update of the official way you classify uh, low-grade gliomas is going to incorporate this. And we're very excited. Uh, the TCJ group that led this project, which we're a part of, uh, is very excited to uh, go all the way from massive sequencing through molecular analysis to actually change the way we think about treating cancer. Ultimately, we want to do this for every type of cancer. And in fact, we want to set up a very nimble system. Instead of working through the cycle of learn something, publish it, gradually it gets into the, the literature, and then gradually the medical treatment community picks it up and starts using it, we want to speed that up by having a global database and global exchange of data so that we can learn rapidly about effectiveness of different treatments depending on molecular status, feed that back in and use it in a, in a virtuous cycle. 
If we can do that, I think we will have achieved what we want to do. The same model applies to other diseases besides cancer. But the number one infrastructure issue is we have to be able to aggregate massive amounts of information. Second challenge would be then to interpret that from the point of view of how it actually affects treatment. But we will only be able to accelerate this area if we can actually accomplish both of these things. And the GA4GH is hitting very, very hard on this essential part of it. I want to thank uh, uh, the members of the working group. Um, these are the leaders of the different working groups um, that have been established, uh, continuing on this page. Um, and uh, I want to thank, in particular, uh, sorry, more uh, leaders of the working group. Um, I mentioned Matt, for example, and Steve. Um, uh, there are a lot of other collaborators. In fact, the Dave Patterson group, the AMP Lab, has been a great collaborator. These are my colleagues who established the, uh, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Uh, Richard works with me, uh, co-leading the team, and we work with a number of other institutions, Stand Up to Cancer, International Cancer Genome Consortium, and others. And this is finally the team uh, at UCSC uh, that's working on this. So I want to thank everybody. It's a great team. These are uh, both some past and a lot of present people um, working on this problem at this point from various angles. They are amazing, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, David. And I know we have a number of people who have interesting questions. We have mics, so we have a few minutes, and if David will indulge, go a few sure. minutes after. Uh, we'd love to get a dialogue going. And since we're um, taking, we can use these, please. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. Okay. Uh, so you talked a lot about putting the genome sequences on the cloud. Yeah. And I know I read recently about Illumina doing something similar. With yes. Base space. Base space. Yes. So I was wondering what the differences were with base space and what you're doing. Well, you know, base space is specific implementation, and they launched ahead of uh, us developing all of the interface standards. So we're trying to work with Illumina now. We have a couple of members of Illumina that are on the Global Alliance teams, and we're trying to harmonize our API with the API that they kind of launched ahead and developed. Thanks. Hi. If, if I was a practicing oncologist today, or training to be one, how could I participate? I'm, from, I'm thinking from a clinical standpoint. Is there something I should be doing right now to either think about like moving my patients towards contributing to the database, or is there a way for me to tap into researchers who might be working on an area of cancer that I see in a patient? It'd be, if, if you're a practicing oncologist, you're probably at a medical institution, so the first step would be to get make sure your medical institution is a member of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And then uh, there, are, there are ways of interacting with the Global Alliance that you would have specialists within your institution do. You don't want to do all the geek stuff. You don't want to be on the GitHub site and so forth. But if somebody else in, in your institution is inclined that way, uh, then they can be your conduit for connecting with the Global Alliance. Um, in terms of uh, you know, working with the clinical working group, which would probably be the primary one, uh, again, somebody would establish a contact, keep up with what the latest things they're doing, and, and uh, understand what kind of driving projects uh, that might, you know, might be relevant for you um, as models for what you're doing. Um, the uh, actual process of, of collecting data from individual patients is something that the Global Alliance doesn't do itself, but we sponsor external groups for doing that, and we try to put you in touch with those external groups. Uh, the Global Alliance itself is not trying to build the giant database, but to facilitate others to build those databases in a way that are compatible. So we could work with your institution, for example, to try to help them create a compatible or make a choice so that they have a API compatible database for these kinds of things. And then you could do these kinds of comparisons. Uh, there are a number of groups that are down more in the immediate level of 
How, what, what, what kind of test can I get from my patient right now? And there, if you're not on a clinical trial, it's hard to get um, a, a commercial full genome test. Um, but if you're part of a clinical trial, if you're a physician or you're referred to a physician that's part of a clinical trial that involves full genome sequencing, then that's good. And you can look at uh, clinicaltrials.gov to try to find those or something like that. Uh, but there are a number of uh, outfits like uh, Foundation Medicine and others that will do select cancer genes and do the genetic analysis of those. So you can look online for those kinds of analyses as well. Hi, David. Uh, as someone who saw your, the first talk by you was on BC dimension, a very long oh. time ago. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm awed by the progress you've made in pushing that technology to world-class problems. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I want to take you back to the virtuous circle picture. Yes. And how this database drives uh, policy. Right. Where do pharma and FDA sit as the notion of a, a drug developed for a very small number of patients that will have very specific types of cancers. What does that process need to do to change to be able to have that level of texture to what makes a good treatment for a particular patient? Well, it's a, it, there's a lot of social work that needs to be done to uh, accelerate the uh, deployment of new ideas and new methods into treatment. Um, faster than it currently is. The problem with the current, the current clinical trials are very slow and very narrow. And uh, even the FDA, though, is excited about getting larger and larger trials and making them adaptive, where you can actually uh, change the way you treat patients during the course of the trial based on what you learn during the trial. So this is the key notion that we have to accept, and the FDA is starting to accept uh, actual adaptive clinical trials. And so we're working in, inward out, right? You, so you can say, okay, here's a trial that's sponsored by a university and a pharmaceutical company, and it's somewhat adaptive. Then you can merge these together. The iSpy2 project, for example, that's run out of UCSF that we work heavily on is a breast cancer trial that involves 12 different arms of treatment and many, many different pharmaceutical companies supplying different drugs. And they do a molecular characterization and steer the woman into one of those. And that molecular characterization can change and adapt during the course of the trial. So we're getting there. You know, that's an intermediate step. If you think about that doing that globally or on a really big scale, then you're kind of at that virtuous cycle. Hi there. Um, Thanks for the talk. I was curious, going back to the circle with the patient being at the top, when the patient isn't always in a clinical um, trial setting, they're just yes. uh, you know, a patient visiting their oncologist, it, there's also the need for it, um, genomic data to be integrated into the electronic health record. So I was curious on your list of stakeholders to not have seen any of those large vendors, because there's obviously a lot of health right. IT standards and interoperability work that's also been done. I saw Dixie Baker who's a part of that world yes. on your list Dixie, as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I was curious if there are plans to um, you know, work with electronic health record vendors. Absolutely. Kind of, yeah. We want to bring them in, and we are getting some interest at this point. Some are kind of wait and see. Others are starting to get involved. So I think as this picks up more and more steam, that the vendors will get involved from that sector as well. The, the, the informatics companies were the first to get involved, the people that were wanted to, wanted to get in on the ground floor of something new. Um, the old timers in biomedical information are slower to come around. But they'll come around. Yes? Uh, how do you plan to interface with uh, genetics information companies like uh, 23andMe? Yes. So we have a number of those companies. So t uh, Kevin Jacobs from 23andMe is doing our benchmarking uh, team, and they are uh, very, very uh, aggressively uh, setting up standards and exchange formats. Uh, they'll be involved a lot in our annotation and analyzing the effect of a different human variant and how do we standardize that, uh, which was the problem that 23andMe ran into with the FDA. I think they hadn't standardized enough of how they reported the uh, effect of a variant. Um, we have, yeah, DNA, uh, I, I'm sorry to insult one of the companies that I don't list, but uh, you know, DNA Nexus, Curiverse, Seven Bridges, uh, the Golden Helix, uh, 
it, it's hard. Uh, almost every one of them is involved with us. We're, we're really pleased that the uptake of that kind of, kind of company has been spectacular. They all so, are so involved. So eventually, do you see the possibility of taking a preventive approach to cancer, uh, knowing one's DNA? Well, the statistics of cancer are that it, it's going to eventually happen uh, no matter how good your lifestyle is if you live long enough. I mean, that's a, that's a crude statement, but it is kind of a, an accumulation of probability of mutation over a long time. So I don't think it can be completely prevented, but we certainly are excited about uh, extending prevention. And a lot of the drop in cancer that we're seeing now is the smoking, anti-smoking campaign is really starting to pay off in lung cancer. So obviously prevention can be huge, um, but it's not, um, it's not the total solution. I'm afraid we won't be able to uh, completely prevent cancer from occurring. We should be able to just treat it quickly and adaptively. And we have one time for one more question. Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> I was wondering about the implications for cancer epidemiology, where it's alleged yes. at a certain site or a certain location. Right. Uh, that there's a cluster of, of similar sites, sim similar um, yes. uh, cancers, but if the, uh, di if the, in the diagnosis is so, let's say, individualized, or that it's a, each person in that area is somehow, you know, they have their own rare disease, is this going to sort of obfuscate any notion of, of making some company or some government liable for some kind of pollution that's So there are, there are signatures that you see in the DNA mutations that occur with different types of carcinogens. So this is also answering the previous question. For example, if your cancer is caused by exposure to ultraviolet light, it's obvious from looking at the mutations that you get on a statistical level. There's certain mutations. Uh, tar from cigarettes also. So there are a number of environmental uh, causes of cancer that reflect themselves in the DNA mutations, and those will be great to study once our data set gets large enough to match the epidemiology data sets. To be honest, right now, it's much smaller than that. Uh, you know, it, records of who has cancer are, are you know, we're talking millions, um, but we, you know, we're not there yet with the DNA. But when we do, I think there will be an opportunity. Well, that was wonderful, David. Thank you for bringing us through. If you all join me in thanking him. It's been a fabulous uh, wrap-up to our research seminars this fall. Again, we thank you very much. We look forward to you joining us again in January. And again, thank you, David, for a wonderful session. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.